say to you? It restates the negativeness of the universe, the hideous, lonely emptiness of existence, nothingness, the predicament of man forced to live in a barren, godless eternity. Ah, uh, the holiday season, the joyous time of year of friendship and family. Yeah, well, it's come and gone once again, and I'm always sad to say it's over. But one thing I notice every year, and I'm sure many of you, my dear friends, have seen it as well, is that it seems there may just be a little bit of a war on Christmas. A war that finds a new target of its ire per annum. This year, it was the fact that the majority of people don't think that Santa Claus should be a trans woman, and should remain instead jolly old Saint Nick, rather than Nicolette. The revelation that the half-century-old animated Rudolph special is, depending on who you ask, either racist or homophobic, because it depicts a character who is ostracized and, through hard work, becomes a beloved hero. The continual removal of traditional holiday songs, specifically Baby It's Cold Outside, for being problematic. And now, the decade-old general trend of replacing a Merry Christmas with more culturally neutral and sensitive terms. That concept of the war on Christmas was something that Trump railed about a decent amount during his campaign, and despite his assertion in mid-2018 that it was being ameliorated, I'm not so sure. Hey, well, guess what? We're saying Merry Christmas again. I sure saw my fair share of it this past holiday season, and given that we've had a little bit of time to sit back and think about it, I want to ruminate a bit on things that I've seen. I have to wonder, is there really a war on Christmas? Is it a war on Christmas directly, or is there some sort of contention with the cultural norms that Christmas and many of these characters represent? Well, when I thought about it, I started to ask, what is the crux of the holiday season that was being denigrated? About all of these icons, what do they sort of have in common? Why well, would say it's things like concepts of deservedness. Santa only brings presents to good girls and boys, while bad children receive coal. Santa has something very special in his sack for you too. Meritocracy and work ethic. I mean, Rudolph in the classic film that's been recently lambasted proves his value through a dangerous adventure and comes out the hero on the other side. And traditional roles, be they male and female or others, as being healthy and normal, rather than, as they've been portrayed more recently, as potentially deleterious and harmful, with Baby describing a couple flirting, now almost unilaterally deemed sexist and somehow supportive of sexual assault. What do all of those things have in common? generally speaking. In part, I would suggest it's that those who wish to see them gone wish to see it done so because they believe that something about these icons and the world itself is unjust or intrinsically unfair and needs to be fixed. The problem with that is that believing the world is inherently unjust means that no mitigating act or acts can ever possibly fully alleviate it because the world's still inherently bad. But what about people who believe that the world is, to the contrary, an inherently good and just place, where actions and their consequences exist in a construct of good as being always rewarded and bad as always being punished? To get a better idea, let's look today at the concept of perceptions of universal justness or unjustness and discover just who believes in a just world. Lerner and Miller, 1978, initially posited this idea of the just world hypothesis, describing it thusly. Individuals have a need to believe that they live in a world where people generally get what they deserve. The belief that the world is just enables the individual to confront his physical and social environment as though they were stable and orderly. Without such a belief, it would be difficult for the individual to commit himself to the pursuit of long-range goals or even to the socially regulated behavior of day-to-day -day life. Since the belief that the world is just serves such an important adaptive function for the individual, people are very reluctant to give up this belief. And they can be greatly troubled if they encounter evidence that suggests that the world is not really just or orderly after all. Page 2030-2031. to 2031. 
So basically, what Lerner and Miller have described here is a human need, an actual need, not a desire. Everyone in point has some proclivity towards it, to trust that good actions will be rewarded and bad actions will be judged fairly through the outcomes that they receive in order to cope with the reality of things, which is that that's not actually accurate. The supposition that the world is just is untrue. But with that definition in mind, let's explore just what is a belief in a just world, or what I'll call pretty frequently BJW from here on. Hundreds, likely thousands of articles have been written on the belief in the just world since Lerner first proposed the theory. Today's video is going to utilize reviews of some of the early research from Furnham and Proctor in 1989 and some of the slightly more recent literature from Furnham 2003 and lots of stuff later and in between. But these are massive reviews, so check those out. As always, everything cited in the description. But specifically, I want to mention in a 1998 review of the hypothesis, Lerner himself specified that there are two main manners in which this trait of BJW manifests. One being conscious, which concerns how we actively think about morality and make judgments about morality socially, and the other being preconscious, which concerns automatic heuristic responses to situations and serves as an emotional buffer and as an explanation as to why bad things happen without having to think too hard about why they happen. We just know that they happen because someone did something bad. That's why they received a negative outcome. It doesn't have to follow logically, they just must have deserved it. That means, though, by nature of this, it's usually not a conscious decision to blame the victim of a crime, even when we tend to do it, but rather a subconscious propensity to view the victim of any negative consequence as somehow having earned it through their actions. And therefore, these negative outcomes must be just. As Lerner initially described it, the BJW is not just a simple trait, but an ongoing necessity which protects one's own sanity and mind from the facts and statistics that we recognize as logically true, but which are existentially disconcerting. That is, we know deep down logically and intellectually that bad things happen to innocent good people, and there's nothing that can be done about it in most cases. But the BJW causes those who possess it, particularly to high levels, to casually posit otherwise, lest they be driven mad by confronting the harshness of reality. That's why the BJW is an emotional buffer. And it's why Lerner described BJW as a fundamental delusion of the human condition. Much like other types of cognitive heuristics, mental shortcuts, the BJW likely evolved in humans to assist us in processing information quickly and to make snap judgments to alleviate the need for our brains to work too hard before reacting to some kind of stimuli. So in other words, the BJW serves as a psychological shield against the inherent unfairness of life that we logically know exists, but which we don't want to believe in. It allows for those who score high in it to see pretty much everything that happens as a just result or outcome of some behavior, allowing them to not strain themselves too much in having to carefully and individually process every single judgment in its justness or injustice, and accept the statistical realities that life is not fair. But if we all kind of understand this, how can we delude ourselves into believing the world is a just place when there is precisely so much evidence for its unjust nature? Well, May's 1998 proposed that perceptions of justice exist in two independent states, imminent justice and ultimate justice. Imminent justice is payback for previously incurred action, while ultimate justice is belief that in the future, any wrongs will be righted. If a gay man gets AIDS, well, for someone high in the BJW, that's just desserts. It's his paused pie, if you will, for being a degenerate in the past. And if he doesn't have AIDS yet, he will surely receive his gift in the mail soon. Thank you very much. You'll be getting a handsome Simulfax copy of your own words in the mail soon. No. And my reply. Oh, by golly, Mr. President. Thank you're you for a question. This idea of deservedness brings us to another factor of the belief in the BJW, which is self-efficacy of behavior. We recognize that some people really are innocent victims of their circumstances, and even people high in BJW feel pity and empathy for them. But if some people are innocent victims, well then that reality means that the world cannot truly be just, because victims cannot be innocent. Not truly, they have to have done something to have earned their place. This creates an uncomfortable state of cognitive dissonance that is rectified often by evaluations of locus of control. That is, the ability to choose one's own actions and be the determiner of one's own fate. People high in the BJW may feel more sympathy for people who are low in locus of control. 
For example, animals and children have little to no capacity to make decisions regarding their personal care, which is why animal and child abuse particularly tends to rend our heartstrings. There's nothing that an animal or a child can really have done to deserve maltreatment and, you know, cause one to make smack a baby. It's uh, about... I just gotta... It's I about got, baby. I'm, actually, I'm actually in a hurry. Oh, smack a baby. It's very interesting title. In contrast, despite everything that we know logically about how powerful and overwhelming addictions can be, when a smoker gets cancer, well, someone with high BJW might say, he chose to smoke, serves him right. There are times when a lack of efficacy just doesn't result in feelings of sympathy, but rather, get ready for it, I'm gonna use the accursed term, no, not that one, victim blaming. One of actually the most studied aspects on how BJW functions. You could potentially argue that the entire crux of the ongoing debate about whether or not a woman who has been sexually assaulted may have somehow deserved it, that's still a hot topic right now in the era of the Me Too movement, essentially boils down to perceptions of self-efficacy and belief in a just or unjust world. Obviously, of freaking course, no one deserves to be assaulted. Unless you're a peanut. Just like no one deserves to be robbed. But... Believers in a just world would contend. Well, if I want to avoid being robbed, I wouldn't walk down a dark alley in Baltimore City at night waving around a stack of cash. Or, well, if I don't want to be assaulted, I'll avoid posting any bills. This again is not logical. It's so people can try to rectify their own beliefs, to understand that the world is not just on a logical and intellectual level, but also not wanting to believe that because it is at odds with one's perceptions, things that make you feel better about existence. And I would say, when it comes to the example of the Bills, that's where I think a lot of the current disagreement and debate lies. Do you really have the power to say no to your boss or to someone else in a powerful position if they pressure you into sex? Where does the efficacy lie in that instance? I would say it's up to debate. Individual people, therefore with similarly strong or weak levels of the BJW, often hold different beliefs and opinions on any of these topics based on their perceptions of self-efficacy, their personality differences, and many other variables. Not everyone is exactly the same, obviously, but I need to say that. Foley and Piggott, 2000, found that women both high and low in BJW equally attributed blame to a female rape victim, for example. Further, Hammond, Barry, and Rodriguez, 2011, found that BJW alone had no direct effect on whether or not participants believed that the accuser or the accused in a case of date rape was more or less responsible for the act. But instead, BJW served as a moderator variable when participants also believed in various, quote, rape myths. Rape myths is a scale that I dislike because they're not always myths. One of the items is women sometimes use rape accusations as a way to get back at ex-boyfriends. Yeah, because that's never happened before. Not at all. Yavino accepted a plea deal admitting she had made up the assault allegation because, as her arrest warrant affidavit stated, quote, it was the first thing that came to mind and she didn't want to lose another male student as a friend and potential boyfriend. And the affidavit also said Yavino believed when the other student, quote, heard the allegation, it would make him angry and sympathetic to her. But on the note of passing judgment, there is rich evidence on how people who hold these beliefs make decisions regarding the legal system, both in civil and criminal cases. Foley and Piggott, 2000, again, use a scenario of a civil case wherein a woman was reported to have been raped in her apartment after she complained about a possible intruder multiple times to her landlord. So she's someone who seems to be an actual innocent victim, someone who took precautions and therefore had no self-efficacy when it came to her victimization. Regardless, high BJW participants attributed more responsibility and awarded less money to the victim than did those low in BJW. This is because, again, it's psychologically damaging potentially to the BJW to accept the victim as truly innocent. The notion threatens the very worldview and its subsequent emotional buffering effects. Butler and Moran, 2007, similarly found that among Florida jurors, oh God, I bet Florida man was there. Florida man before committing a sexual act on a tree, yelling he was a Suspects god. Suspects tried to start a fire with spaghetti sauce. Was karate kicking those birds with attack. Masturbating at a bus stop, told police he was Captain Kirk. Belief in a just world was related in part to greater propensity to suggest the death penalty for a man accused of robbing a convenience store and killing the clerk over the $300 in the register. Despite the defendant being described as a veteran who had been abused as a child, and suffered from depression. You know, things that might have made people a bit more sympathetic to him? 
Regardless of his potential hardships that others might see as mitigating factors in prescribing his walk up the ladder to go to bed, high BJW participants were more likely to support sending him to the gallows. In addition to being harsh on people from a legal perspective, BJW is also kind of uniquely related to distaste for the impoverished. With Harper et al. 1980 finding that people who believe in a just world often tend to also believe that the poor have done something to deserve their fate, be it by not working hard enough or by living under corrupt governments that they're not trying to overthrow, and therefore they're responsible for their impoverished status. Well, I think they should attack the lower classes, uh, first with bombs and rockets destroying their homes, and then when they run helpless into the streets, uh, mowing them down with machine guns. If it sounds like I'm painting people who believe in a just world as uncaring assholes, let me be clear, they're not inherently. As I said, there's a lot of variation here. And we know a lot about that variation and the personality traits associated with it because we've been studying them for 40 years. So let's go through some of that research and see what other traits typify those who believe in a just world. From a demographic standpoint, O'Connor et al. 1996, in a review of 33 studies, found that both men and women are essentially equally likely to believe that the world is inherently just. In terms of other demographics, however, yeah, there's some differences. Hunt 2000 found, in contrast to what he expected, that people of a lower social economic status are more likely to believe that the world is just. Poor people are more likely to think that the world is a good place to live in. But the effect that he found was completely reversed when he accounted for race. In general, black people and Latino people were significantly less likely than whites to hold a high BJW rating. Similarly, while Hunt found that women were slightly less prone towards the BJW in general, that effect also disappeared when he accounted for race, as only minority women were less likely to believe in the just world, causing Hunt, in his conclusion of the article, to describe the BJW as a quintessentially white experience. Just take what you want, Mr. White. Pay us back any time. Or don't. We don't care. <laughs> I'm probably putting words in this guy's mouth, but Hunt more or less suggested that this is because white people are so much better off and being white's just so great. <laughs> you know, we rarely suffer any kind of negative life events compared to minorities who suffer all kinds of terrible, terrible struggles in their lives. That may be the reason why minorities are less likely than whites to be high believers in a just world. While it is true that Lipkiss and Siegler 1993 found that those with a strong BJW reported fewer acts of personal discrimination having been occurred against them than those with weaker BJW, that relationship quickly becomes very confounding when you start to think about it causally, right? Do black people not develop a belief in a just world because they were discriminated against first? Or do white people have a belief in the just world first and then not perceive themselves as being discriminated against because they see the world as a good place and because the BJW serves as an emotional buffer against any actual discrimination they may face? Which comes first in the model fit? Actually being a victim or thinking you're the victim? I obviously can't say for sure linearly, but I can say a wealth of evidence has shown that belief in a just world is a stable trait over time even in the face of unfair life events, such as having a disabled child, according to the research of Dr. Claudia Daubert from 1996. It's one of the reasons why BJW is a trait rather than a state. As I explained, this doesn't mean it's applied equally in all instances across all people all the time, but if you possess high BJW when you're eight, you're likely to continue to possess relatively high BJW when you're 80, regardless of any unfair or negative events that befall you in the interim. Even flood victims who believed in a just world, people who had just been involved in a serious flood, many of whom lost family members, reported lower instances of anxiety, depression, and various other types of psychological distress. While the opposite was so in those who believed in an unjust world, as found by Otto et al. 2006. While Otto and colleagues found that the BJW does not provide a buffer against symptoms of PTSD, it seems that it works much as Lerner suggested, as a psychological coping method. Lipkus, Dalbert, and Siegler, 1996, found similarly that in addition to being more resilient to depression and anxiety, people high in BJW reported higher general life satisfaction. Dalbert, in her extensive book on the positive outcomes of this psychological shielding, 
posits that these effects are because BJW can be as much a pro-social thing as it can involve denigrating victims. It can provide a sense of social support, of stability, and provides resilience against rumination. That is, sitting around and crying, oh, woe is me all day. Gee, can't think of who that describes at all. Donald J. Trump is now president of the United States. The benefits of belief in a just world don't end at being seemingly just happier, less likely to suffer from mental illness and being more resilient to stressors. Those who believe in it also generally have healthier romantic relationships. Lipkus and Bissonnette, 1998, found that both dating partners and married couples alike were more accommodating towards their partner when they were high in the BJW. And this, the BJW, was uniquely responsible for accommodating communication outside of other potential explanatory variables, such as trust and perspective taking. It's also possible that people with the BJW in extensive degrees, given that psychological buffering effect, are less affected by stressors that might cause them to struggle in school. As Barling and Mendelssohn, 1999, found that in tandem with a negative mood state, children who believed in an unjust world forwarded lowered performance in school. To recap, what we know so far is that people who believe in a just world seem to be generally better off emotionally. But what else predicts one holding high BJW other than being FUCKING A WHITE MALE? Well, you might say, obviously, Aiden, it must be a pattern of irrational thinking since inherently, the BJW is a heuristic error in logic. It is that fundamental delusion of the mind. But Stowers and Durham 1998 did not find a relationship between the BJW and other irrational beliefs regarding the world. Thus, believing in the fantasy that bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people does not overlap to other kinds of fantastical thinking. And I want to say that first because I know a few people might be even more prone to think that the personalities, beliefs, and behaviors most associated with the BJW are irrational or insane because they also tend to be conservative ones. It would not be inaccurate to say that belief in a just world is a general tendency of people who lean more politically to the right than to the left. Most directly, numerous studies on voting behavior have found that people with high BJW are more likely to support conservative political parties in both the United States and the United Kingdom. But simply voting doesn't necessarily mean much about one's political views or values. I voted for Trump and I'm not a Republican, nor had I ever voted Republican until 2016. No, this is my political party of choice. I think I could stand up there for the whole debate and not say anything and, and emerge as a leader. So what about other personality traits? Numerous studies have linked BJW to right-wing authoritarianism. Now, right-wing authoritarianism is an instrument originally constructed by Adorno of the notorious Frankfurt School to supposedly measure fascistic beliefs, but it turned out that it was measuring pretty much everyone to the right of Marx as a fascist. So rather than scrap the thing and start over, believing that its premise might be flawed, researchers pretty much just took it and reworked it a little bit and now call it the right-wing authoritarianism instrument, or RWA. Which is a slightly less offensive term, but equally silly in that it still includes all types of potentially, quote, right-leaning concepts as equally authoritarian in nature. By that I mean this. There are questions on this measurement that ask about the importance of rigid political structure and emphasis on law and order, but there's also questions that ask about morality, religious belief, and whether or not you simply think that being a feminist or gay makes you inherently brave. Regardless of my many issues with the RWA instrument, it's a measure consistently related to other measures of conservatism. And respect for powerful authority figures is a reasonable thing we could expect from those high in BJW, because if someone's in a position of power, they probably believe that that person deserves, on some level, to be there. They must have earned it. Speaking of morality and religion, though, a little bit, that too is unsurprisingly related to BJW. Not a big shocker there. God rewards the pious and punishes the evil. Although Hunt, in that study I mentioned before, noted there was no impact of religion on Black and Latino participants towards a greater experience of the BJW. That could be because of the association with BJW and something else, Protestant work ethic. A trait typified by avoidance of wasting time, the importance of hard work, 
delayed gratification, self-reliance, and perhaps most importantly, a belief that effort will pay off in the end. If it also sounds like by me describing Protestant work ethic that I'm essentially discussing a measurement of belief in capitalism, that's because that's more or less how it was initially proposed in one of the most foundational texts in sociology, written in 1906 by Dr. Max Weber, describing it the spirit of capitalism. Although I should note that Rim 1983, in a study of Israeli students, found no direct correlation between BJW and opinions towards capitalism, he did find a negative association between BJW and socialism. At the same time, he found a negative relationship with BJW and laissez-faire and libertarian beliefs. But considering the negative attitudes towards the poor and a lot of other things that we know about BJW, I'm a little bit skeptical about that study. But hey, speaking of those negative attitudes towards the poor, one of the premises of the BJW is that people with a strong belief in it may be particularly likely to help others that they do perceive of as innocent victims in need of help. But this has only been supported when those people believed their helpful actions would have real, actionable consequences. The act of helping others who have been the victim of an injustice functionally allows the individual, the helper, to right the wrong, therefore reinforcing their own belief that the world is just because they made it so. Miller, 1977, asked participants to read a story about a woman. Let's give her a name. How about this? Mrs. Or just Mrs. N, whose husband had recently abandoned her and their family, and who was now struggling to provide for her two children. In one condition, the participants were asked to provide aid for just Mrs. N. In another, instead they were asked to help many women in a similar situation. Those high in BJW were significantly more likely than those low in the trait to sign up to give money to the single woman. For those high, it was an average of 9 participation sessions and 18 Canadian dollars, which adjusted for inflation is something like 69 Canadian today? You're currently earning 20,000 Canada's- Canada dollars! <laughs> What, so I'm, f I'm fucking Canada rich? Just because I cut down trees in the backyard? Compared to those low in BJW, who were slightly more likely to help the group, but in both collective and individual cases, gave less than half as much as the high BJWs gave individually to Mrs. N. In a second experiment, participants were then asked to donate money for a short-term fundraiser for hungry families during the Christmas season, or to sign up for a year-long campaign to raise money for impoverished families. Again, for short-term help, high BJW individuals were the most generous, offering what would be about 6.5 Canadian today adjusted for inflation. But they were willing to give very little to these long-term campaigns, compared to those low in BJW, who donated similarly to both campaigns at a comparative modern day around 450 Canadian. We've also seen this kind of individual altruism outside of the lab and in real-world settings of aid-giving, as Bierhoff, Klein, and Crump, 1991, used a purpose of sample of participants who had witnessed some sort of automobile accident and had either offered aid or had not authored aid, and found that aid-givers tended to have a stronger belief in a just world and have a higher internal locus of control. So are high BJWs altruists or assholes? Remember how I said that BJW is an emotional buffer? We can actually see just how that manifests in perceptions of risk, and even in relationship to other aspects of, let's say, conservatism, that authoritarian scale that I so dislike. One thing that's common in a lot of measures of conservatism is fear and concern about society degrading. Conservatives are trying to conserve something, you know, by definition. But this means that they also tend to express some form of continual fearfulness about society. People who believe in a just world, however, we would expect at least, to be less prone to anticipate bad things will happen to them, right? Maybe that's why they're more willing to help, but again, only in individual cases. Interestingly, Lambert Burroughs and Nguyen, 1999, found that belief in a just world had an effect on risk assessment in authoritarians. High authoritarians perceived great risk and threats to the self and to others when and only when they were low in just world beliefs. But authoritarians high with belief in the just world perceived considerably less risk to themselves and to others regarding all kinds of serious dangers assessed in this study, including catching AIDS or being involved in a plane crash. 
while there's some potential pitfalls there in terms of uh, making an inaccurate risk analysis or assessment about, let's say, STDs and ending up with the old herp because you didn't wrap it before you tapped it, it may also represent an emotional stability that's present in people high in BJW over other traits that allows them to, again, cope better than people who are more persistently worrying or have high neuroticism. Neuroticism itself, which is a trait that Noodleman, 2013, found in a meta-analysis, is consistently negatively related to belief in a just world. What I find a little bit more interesting about this, or more important, is that this association potentially indicates the reason why conservatism is related to BJW, at least on some level. Because BJW is a natural coping mechanism against fears and neurotic behavior that are typically otherwise higher in people who are a bit more conservative. But the problem is, again, in determining a causal connection there. Do people become more conservative because they have this fundamental delusion Lerner described? Or do naturally more conservative people develop a belief in a just world specifically because of its emotional buffering nature in a combination of other factors? Lerner suggested that belief in a just world is learned through social interaction during childhood. Calls to remove traditional fairy tales like that of Rudolph, stories where people are rewarded for doing good and cast down for doing bad, even things like the concept of meritocracy in earning your reward in children's media have seemingly been frequently attacked recently in the mainstream. And the war on Christmas? That's far from new, as I said. Be it a call for Santa Claus to be more progressive to removing Christian symbols from the Christian holiday season. Now, trust me, I'm the first one to point out that Christmas is originally a pagan holiday. But also, Christianity, as I've described, is kind of a perfect exemplar of what we call a just world belief. To those of us on the outside, it often seems entirely pointless and irrational as to why those on the left take umbrage with these tiny little minutia, why they rage into the void over any perceived slight in media, be it decades old. But could it be because there's something about all of this that ties them together, a general nucleus of all of this, which relates to belief in a just world? And could it have to do a little bit with the fact that people who tend to believe in a just world, people who might be more influenced or have been more influenced as children by these kinds of messages in the media, although we'll talk about that in a future video, also tend to be just a little bit more conservative. And more specifically, tend to be conservative white males. You know, the thing they'll outright tell you sometimes are the root of all evil. Stop demonizing people and realize the biggest terror threat in this country is white men, most of them radicalized right up to the right. Well, if you can't just kill them here, you know, like they do in South Africa, then I suppose you could try to make sure they don't propagate through subtle social pressures and the alteration of cultural norms that dissuade anything that might result in more white male conservatives. Hang on with me here. I'm going somewhere. If you believe that white male conservatives are evil, wouldn't you want to do anything that you could possibly do to remove them, to lessen the number of them? They say this actively on Twitter all the time and it's allowed for some reason. But if you can't kill them, could you change society by affecting the environment in which children grow up and therefore realistically affect society in such a way that there would be fewer people with belief in a just world and therefore potentially fewer white male conservatives? But for that thing that I just stated there to have any merit at all, we have to figure out, first of all, if belief in a just world is a product of heredity or of environment, and attempt to understand how this belief develops in children. We know from twin studies research, for example from a court 1999, that there are genetic factors which account for about 50% of the variance in right-wing authoritarianism. But while we know that BJW is related to authoritarianism, it is a unique construct. As we've learned, people with high BJW tend to be happier, have a more positive outlook, and be altruistic. All of which are things that have not typically been positively associated with role orientation or authoritarianism. Although, again, I would say these findings are a little bit spurious because of the schizophrenic nature of the instrument, but I digress. But we've also seen that people high in authoritarianism do not necessarily possess a strong BJW. So, is BJW similarly hereditary in nature? First, we need to understand the difference between the type of imminent justice that is expressed by pretty much all young children and the belief in a just world, which, as we've seen, varies highly across adults. Uh, 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 uh. 
Jean Piaget, the father of developmental psychology, suggested that the vast majority of children have a very simplistic and basic concept of morality that he described as imminent justice. We've talked about it before, but we'll get back into it. Believing things to be simply good or bad, given the state of their development of empathy, being still ongoing, and also they tend to assume that everyone's going to agree with them about whether or not something's right or wrong. To illustrate this, Piaget read a story to a number of young children, where a boy steals some apples, and then shortly thereafter falls into a stream. The children responded that the boy fell into the stream because he misbehaved, even though we as adults can recognize that those two events do not follow causally. Billy did not fall into the stream because he stole apples. That's a non sequitur, but illustrative of how children perceive of morality. Jose in 1990 further tested this concept across different age groups and found that in first graders, 56% of them, compared to 21 to 25% in older children, reported that the non-causal punishment was a product of the character's wrongdoing. That is, in first grade, children still believed in this non sequitur, about 56% of them, but that quickly dissipated as they aged. However, while the older age group recognized that these events did not follow logically, they were more likely to report finding the negative outcome as fair only when the character in the story had committed a wrongdoing. In other words, they recognized that the story was not logical, but they felt it was fair that he got his reward of falling into the stream, for example, only when he had done something wrong in the first place. Thus demonstrating that as we cease in this general belief in imminent justice that all children pretty much hold, and then come to think about justice more cognitively, as our minds develop, we move towards this trait-like belief in a just world. But why does it happen in some people and not in others? There is not a ton of research on this, in large part because twin studies are very expensive and it would be rather difficult to find many children whose parents actively tell them that the world is a terrible place to live in, and it would be immoral to experimentally control for that. She didn't know any of those things. And now she knows all of those things. She's gonna die. Everybody she knows is gonna die. They're gonna be dead for a very long time and then the sun's gonna explode. But Dalbert 2001, in her extensive analysis, conducted a study of children and their parents to see if there were any correlations between possessing the BJW in adults and their offspring. And while she found a direct relationship between parental authoritarianism and children, again, we know that's hereditary, no such relationship was found with the BJW. That is, some children possessed a belief in a just world when neither of their parents did and vice versa. Dr. Dalbert also assessed families' self-described orientation towards role orientation, you know, a more authoritarian sort of tendency, or emotional orientation, predicting that it is likely that having a positive emotional environment is a large part of why some people develop a belief in a just world, an argument that Hunt and many others have made in explaining racial disparities, predicting that growing up and experiencing discrimination may be why minorities are so much less likely to possess beliefs in the just world. Although, as I've said, the wealth of research indicates that BGW is a stable life construct, uh, typically unaffected by negative life events, as we discussed. Anyway, Dr. Dalbert found, as she predicted, a relationship between a harmonious, emotionally positive family environment and children's propensity to believe that the world is inherently just. Interestingly, this was uniquely strong in connection to the father's positive emotional descriptors of their family. Uh-oh, friends, I think I just broke the code. <laughs> The removal of the father from the family unit has been going on in the United States for a long time, since the 60s. There are a lot of factors that we can look at to explain why single mother rates have been on the rise for these decades, among them being the fact that the legal system overwhelmingly favors women in custody battles and divorce settlements, a welfare system which financially removes the necessity of a working father, and a social system which celebrates single moms as brave, yes, queen slay. It's gotten to the point where traditional romance is so incredibly lambasted in our society that you can't even have a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman in a video game. A game where genetic ancestry is a given that's not castigated as somehow sexist. I know, there are people out there who still think none of this is real. But how can you seriously believe that when the American Psychological Association is now offering to teach classes to therapists on how to shut down masculinity because they believe that it is inherently toxic and harmful? I never get answers when I ask these kind of questions, by the way. I just get people telling me I'm lying, even though there's screenshots up, you know what I mean? What am I supposed to do? If you have an answer, please provide it. 
The demonization of men and men's role in the family is almost impossible to not notice in entertainment media. I mean, look at the recent Gillette ad. Seriously? But then again, don't ask me. Let's look at the like to dislike ratio. Bruh. But all of that on top of all of the negative correlations that we know between single motherhood and outcomes for their children. Now we also see this variable, belief in a just world, which produces happy, well-adjusted, altruistic people who just also happen to lean more to the right is in fact probably environmental. And it is affected in its environmental nature by a happy household, particularly a happy, harmonious household with a caring, emotionally receptive father figure. While there is still tons of work to be done in furthering our understanding of the many potential factors that are involved in why some of us believe in a just world more than others, decades of research has indicated that there is a genetic component related to various politically aligned beliefs. As Alfred Punk Hibbing 2005 found, while parents' political affiliations with one party or another was genetically related to their children's political affiliations, their genetics were more strongly related to a number of differently held politically related beliefs. If you look at this graph here, you can see that yes, that means that socialism is genetic, at least somewhat. Most things are. So again, if there is always some element of heredity in our political leanings, that just can't be simply eliminated it makes sense to remove something that is seemingly an environmental influence that might cause someone to be more or less conservative or simply just less politically correct, which ultimately is what we talk about when we talk about the negative influence of people who are high in BJW. But hang on, Aiden. You mentioned in the beginning that a lot of these things have been going on for a long time, such as the increase in single mother households and the removal of Christ from Christmas, as well as a left-leaning takeover of the Academy, which has been going on for decades. And if you're correct, wouldn't we see some evidence then that the belief in a just world is dying out as well? Well, there's no specific longitudinal generational data that exists, as far as I know. Calhoun and all 1998 found that the oldest age group, people 59 or older, which assuming these data were collected in 1997, would describe people born during or before the Great Depression, were the ones most likely to view the world as just and controllable. They considered themselves the most lucky and believed others to generally be benevolent more so than did younger generations, particularly those under the age of 25 when these data were collected. They would be Gen Xers or early millennials who viewed the world as the least just, they viewed people as the least benevolent and viewed themselves as the least lucky. How could it be possible that those who grew up during one of the most difficult and tumultuous periods in United States history viewed themselves as the most lucky and were highest in ratings of belief in a just world? And considering that, as I've discussed several times, BJW is a static trait that means it's unlikely for these young people to suddenly gain extreme levels of these beliefs over time. There is no proof of causality here, I'm just providing some evidence. It is indication of a potential decrease in the general BJW trait over time. However, Dalbert 2001, also in her extensive research, proposed that belief in a just world exists in a curvilinear relationship, meaning that it's high when you're young and it's high when you're old and dips and particularly college-age people. So there are reasonable alternative explanations and hypotheses for this finding. If it sounds like I've been describing a crazy conspiracy theory about people who are more left-leaning trying to destroy white men through destroying this one very specific trait or variable, yeah, that's because that is ridiculous. But that's not really what I'm describing. As I said, hear me out. I don't think this describes the average person. I do think that there's people in left-leaning political positions of power, thought leaders and media influencers who do want to discourage happy two-parent homes and to denigrate moral stories about meritocracy and Protestant work ethic that want to remove the happy ever after because they specifically know that it might be related to people having slightly more conservative views, although it doesn't mean that they understand all of the science involved in it. That's why I just spent 40 minutes explaining the science. As I've always said, social science is a real no shit factor, but we have to break it down to really look into the molecules and the small elements that make up what's happening in society and how human communication works. You don't need to have a master's degree in social science of any type to understand a belief in a just world scenario in fiction when you see one. They used to be everywhere. Are they so much anymore? As we've discussed at length now, the belief in a just world is a sense of deservedness. The princess is beautiful because she is also a good person, therefore she deserves good things to come to her because of her virtue. 
In the classic hero's journey of Joseph Campbell, the protagonist, the hero, is forced to struggle in order to achieve his goals. He must go through hell in order to come out on the other side. It is earned reward. I often mention that, according to Moral Foundations theory, people who lean more to the left have a greater value of perceived fairness, more so than conservatives or libertarians. Yet, for some reason, this concept, belief in a just world, which is fundamentally a concept of fairness, is a thoroughly conservative trait in most people, or related to conservatism. I think this is so because of the similar aspects of meritocracy, that heroes deserve their reward, and because meritocracy is inherently unfair. It means not everyone will succeed, at least in part. But ultimately, what I think it really comes down to is the difference between a value of perceived fairness and justness that seems paradoxical, lying in internal versus external locus of control. Internal locus of control is a tendency of people to believe that one has a power to affect and control their own actions and ultimately their own destiny, at least to an extent. Whereas an external locus of control resigns fate to that of the universe. Numerous studies, including the seminal establishment of the very measure and formal definitions of belief in a just world, have noted a consistent correlation between BJW and internal locus of control. While we've mentioned the whole role of religion and divine judgment here, part of the crux of the BJW is the belief in the capacity to affect fate to pull oneself up by the bootstraps, if I'm to quote Anna Kasparian, which involves sometimes superstitious and seemingly external locus of control aspects without really being contradictory. Let me explain. It is possible that the actions of a very determined reindeer will not be directly rewarded because of what he's done, but that he will be rewarded in the long term as a process of ultimate justice because we live in a just world through some spiritual or supernatural fashion that's outside of his actual, actionable control. And ultimately, I think this is a major place where a difference in schism between people who lie more to the right and more to the left often occurs. People who believe in a just world generally think that they get what they deserve in the long run. Thus, they behave in a way that anticipates recompense for hard work. So they work hard expecting to get what they put in. In contrast, people who are low or weak in belief in a just world tend to see themselves as victims of an unjust system. As a result of seeing the world as fundamentally wrong, unjust, and bad, rather than admittedly delusionally just, this means no amount of change will ever represent evidence of justness to those who believe in an inherent and intrinsic flaw in society, reality, and the universe. Oftentimes, political commentators on the right will note how the kind of social justice Marxist demands upon society seem to creep up asking for more and more and more without recognizing and celebrating any alterations and strides that have been made for their movements. While I don't necessarily endorse a slippery slope way of looking at this inherently, it's easy to find evidence in support of that tendency. There have been reasonable demands made from the left, such as gay marriage, but as we go forward into the spiral of increasingly being the current year, with more articles calling for trans Santa Claus or for him to just be more hip, countless more denigrating a cartoon animal as racist or homophobic, and a song about holiday flirting being banned from more and more radio play, it's easy to see this give them an inch, they'll take a mile concern. While I do think that there is a concerted effort, as I said, from those in positions of power politically and in the media to change the cultural landscape and zeitgeist. And you know, because they'll tell you, the average person who leans to the left, who often lacks this belief in a just world, probably just sincerely views reality as inherently unfair. That everything is doom and gloom in a way. They might be a very happy person, but they are never going to get their social justice because they view the world as unjust. This follows logically. It also means that justice can never truly be served in your perception of reality. No cause can ever be won. It's merely a constantly shifting window of increasing or more or less irritating forms of unjust behavior. And every perceived slight is evidence of this never-ending unjustness. Do you see how this works in a cyclical manner, much as it does in people who do believe strongly in a just world? 
But those people who do believe in a just world, they have that psychological resilience against any trauma, that stress, that stuff that does affect all of us. And they use that evolutionary emotional buffer to find examples within the world, in contrast to those who do not believe the world is just, to illustrate how wrongs are righted, how bads are punished, and how their efforts and work is meaningful. Now it is true, without question, people who are high in belief in a just world can be callous, even cruel, when it comes to the necessity that they possess to protect this emotional shield they own. They are quintessentially politically incorrect, but they're happier in part precisely because they see actions as having real observable consequences. Even if they're completely fantastic and unrealistic, rather than finding a new source of outrage, they alter their cognitive schema to see events as fair outcomes of action. People who see the world as unilaterally unjust will never be satiated in their continual moving of goalposts. That's, I don't even think malicious at all. As I've described, it's not actual cognitive action going on in, in your skull. It's going on beneath the surface in that heuristic function. That's likely partially genetic and it's likely partially environmental. Again, as are most things. But I think I've tried to explain why there may be a war on Christmas. It might be real, but I think it's a war on something more fundamental something that truly gets to the core of human psychology, this evolutionary belief in whether or not the world is just or unjust. And if there is a war on Christmas, it will never be over, because those who view the world as an intrinsically bad place, with no ultimate good, no ultimate justice, therefore can never stop fighting it. While there are certainly aspects of people who are high in BJW that can make them uh, rough around the edges, to say the least, have you tried kill all the poor? <laughs> Sir, with respect, you know, we've had this conversation before. I'm just saying, have you tried it? No, of course we haven't tried it. We're not going to try it. I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying run it through the computer, see if it would work. Whether it would work it is not the issue. So you think it might work? That's pretty right wing. <laughs> Their greater satisfaction with life is a product of the belief that regardless of all evidence, good will prevail ultimately. Not the cynicism that no good deed goes unpunished, but that no prayer goes unaccepted. That, I believe, is truly the spirit of Christmas and the spirit of the holidays. Thus, not so much as a late Christmas present to you all, but rather as a suggestion that you should keep the spirit of Christmas at all times through the year, at least, you know, when you can. In 2019, couldn't we all, just for a little bit, try to believe in a just world, just for a little while? If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altonavolt.